Why didn't the Japanese join Operation Barbarossa and attack the Soviet Union in summer 1941? This question comes repeatedly up in one or another way, so time to tackle it. To answer this question properly, we must look at both the German side and the Japanese side, since both parts played their role. Generally, the coordination between Germany and Japan during the World War II was rather lackluster and in some way this was already foreshadowed in August 1939, so just weeks before the outbreak of the war in Europe. At this point, the Japanese were fighting the Red Army at Nomohan, as the Japanese call it, or the battles of Kalkingol, as the Russians call them. In the midst of Zhukov's offensive, with the 23rd Division literally fighting for its life, Japan's reputed ally, Nazi Germany, concluded a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. This dramatic turnabout caused the fall of the cabinet in Tokyo and consternation throughout the army. Let us start with the German side. The short answer is Hitler did not want the Japanese to join the operation and kept them intentionally in the dark as well. This is well reflected by the various documents for the planning and preparation of Operation Barbarossa. So let us start with Führerweisung, the Führer Directive 21, from December 1940, titled Fall Barbarossa, Case Barbarossa. In the section, Anticipated Allies and their roles, there are four entries. Number one. On the wings of our operation, the active participation of Romania and Finland in the war against Soviet Russia is to be expected. In what form the forces of both countries will be subordinated to German command during their engagement will be agreed upon and determined by the high command of the Wehrmacht in due time. Number two, Romania's task will be, together with the group deploying there, to tie up the opposing enemy and to provide auxiliary services in the rear area. Number 3. Finland will have to cover the deployment of the detached German Northern Group, parts of Group 21, coming from Norway and to operate together with it. In addition, Finland will be responsible for the elimination of hunger. Number 4. It can be expected that Swedish railroads and roads will be available for the deployment of German Northern Group at the latest from the beginning of the operation. So, Japan is not even mentioned where Sweden is. Of course, one might argue that the Germans suspected that the Japanese would not join at all. And this seems less the case if you look at Directive 24, which is titled Cooperation with Japan. This directive is from early March 1941. In this document, Barbarossa is mentioned as well. The document notes that Hitler ordered for the co coordination with Japan Number one, the aim of the cooperation established by the tripartite pact must be to bring Japan to active action in the Far East as soon as possible. Strong British forces will thus be tied up and the main interest of the United States of America will be diverted to the Pacific. In view of the still undeveloped readiness of its adversaries for war, Japan's chances of success will be all the greater the sooner it intervenes. The Barbarossa operation creates particularly favorable political conditions for this. No mention of the Soviet Union. Everything is focused on the British Empire and the United States. This continues in the guidelines for operational plans. It is noted a. As a joint objective of warfare, it is to be emphasized to force England down quickly and thereby to keep the USA out of the war. D. The removal of Singapore as England's key position in the Far East would mean a decisive success for the overall warfare of the three powers. Again, everything is focused on the Western Allies, or better, the soon-to-be Western Allies. Yet finally, the last point in the directive is likely the most revealing. Number 5. No hint whatsoever must be given to the Japanese about the Barbarossa operation. The Soviet Union always had a special role for the Axis members. This becomes even more apparent when we look at the pact between Germany, Italy and Japan from September 1940. It is a rather short treaty with just six articles, yet this is the text for the fifth article. Germany, Italy and Japan affirm that the aforesaid terms do not in any way affect the political status which exists at present as between each of the three contracting powers and Soviet Russia. The reasons for this passage are at least twofold. First, it should not affect the Soviet German Pact from 1939, aka the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, and secondly, it made it clear that the pact was mainly aimed at deterring the United States from entering the war. After all, some leading Japanese figures wanted to include the Soviet Union in the pact against the United States. In January 1941, the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs, Matsuoka, 
made a report advocating the realization of a four power pact. However, Russia German relations had already deteriorated and his plan was make believe. Yet back to Germany. Hitler's intention was that Japan use its force in Southeast Asia and not against the Soviet Union. Japan should take out Singapore and conquer important resources like rubber, which would be vital for the war effort, especially if the United States would join the war. This task assigned to Japan to threaten the United States by its expansionism from its Pacific flank and thus to prevent it from intervening in the European war by a potential two-ocean war. The German leadership had wanted to facilitate by double guarantee against the Soviet Union and the United States. Additionally, it is important to point out that Hitler assumed that the Soviet Union would collapse rather fast. Note that after Barbarossa started, Germany several times called for Japan to enter the war against the Soviet Union, although these calls and Hitler's stance was rather inconsistent. The military historian Klaus Schmieder notes about this. Rather than reflecting the perceived need of Japanese help to defeat the Red Army, it was always first and foremost deployed to repeat the sort of deterrent between Tokyo and Washington that Ribbentrop feared was constantly lurking around the corner. So let us move to the Japanese next. The situation is a bit more complicated here, due to the fact that the Japanese lacked a coherent strategy and a single person or organization that shaped it. This meant that at times there were different fuels, goals and actions at work. It was already bad pre-war. Moreover, the situation became even more complicated by the breakout of World War II in Europe. The government and the Imperial Japanese Army tried to approach Germany while the Imperial Japanese Navy opposed the time with Germany and Italy. There is a lot to be said about the Tripartite Pact and the various Japanese factions, yet for brevity let us focus on the aspects that are mainly related to the Operation Barbarossa. First off, we look at the Battle of Nomonhan in summer 1939. To put it simply, the Japanese got a bloody nose. The 6th Army had been annihilated, with between 18 to 23,000 men killed and wounded from May to September 1939, not counting the Manchu Kohen losses. The casualty rate in the 23rd Division was 76%. Sumi's 25th Regiment of the 7th Division suffered 91% casualties. In addition, the Kuangtang Army lost many of its tanks and heavy guns and nearly 150 aircraft. It was the worst military defeat in modern Japanese history up to that time. Now it is important to point out that the Soviets also suffered heavy losses, yet it is without question that the Japanese suffered a serious defeat. Furthermore, the Nomohan disaster was all the more traumatic because the army had employed its premier doctrine, tactics and equipment that is specifically designed to produce a lightning victory. Instead, everything from nighttime bayonet assault to wanted spiritual power had failed. Rather than admit the full implication of the disaster, the High Command blamed the troops of the recently activated 23rd Division and their incompetent officers for the debacle. Yet what was more important here is that about the same time the Germans signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, this was seen as a betrayal by the Japanese and silenced the majority of the Japanese that favored a close German-Japanese cooperation against the Soviet Union. It meant that the Japanese switched from their northern strategy that was against the Soviet Union to a southern strategy that was directed towards the Pacific. The policy option of forcibly cutting off Soviet aid to China and of northern expansion into outer Mongolia and Siberia was discredited in Tokyo by the double defeat in August 1939. The policy of northward expansion never again regained the ascendancy although it was briefly revived in mid-1931, following the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Additionally, Goldman notes that there were some changes in personnel after the Norman Han incident that had an influence on going down the southern strategy as well. In 1940, the Japanese had considered a war with the Red Army, yet they noticed that despite the war in Europe, the Soviet Union had not decreased its divisions in the Far East. Since they had not forgotten their defeat at Norman Han in 1939, they of course took these experiences and the Red Army's strength into account. The Imperial Japanese Army estimated that this army had 30 divisions, while there were only 11 divisions of the Imperial Japanese Army troops stationed in Manchuria. At most, the Imperial Japanese Army could send another 15 divisions, but the total of 26 divisions 
was still insufficient to wage a war against the Soviets. It should be added here that more than doubling the existing divisions would be a monumental effort and likely also draw serious suspicion from the Soviet Union. As outlined in my video why the Japanese attacked the United States, the Japanese were extremely focused on their war with China. In that regard, resources are crucial in two ways. First, the resources that Japan could gain from invading Siberia were rather limited in comparison to those in the Pacific, especially the Dutch East Indies. Second, China also had important supply lines from Southeast Asia as well. So severing these supply lines, while at the same time gaining resources themselves, was more beneficial to the Japanese as well. Therefore, the Imperial Japanese Army temporarily shelved the plan for the northern advance versus the Soviet Union and veered to the south. This was also in line with the German plans as well. For the Japanese to venture into the Pacific, it was crucial to secure the northern flank. This was achieved in April 1941, when the Soviets and Japanese signed a five-year neutrality pact. Each party promised to respect the territorial integrity and, and inviolability of the other contracting party, and they vouched effectively that Japan would stay neutral in a Soviet-German war, and the Soviets would stay neutral in a US-Japan war. Much to the Chinese anger, the Soviets also recognized Manchukuo. Another important aspect that we need to consider is that the Japanese decision-making process and policy changes were rather limited. As mentioned, Hitler explicitly noted in the Directive 24 to not inform the Japanese, yet over time more information reached the Japanese. Japanese sources confirmed that the Japanese ambassador in Berlin informed his superiors about the growing likelihood of a Russian-German war on 16 April 1941. A number of further warnings, each more unambiguous than the previous one, were to follow. When 22nd June came, the Japanese government still managed to act shocked and surprised by the event. Contrary to the Japanese, the British acted quickly upon this information. Even worse, key figures in Japan dismissed this information. The Japanese foreign minister at the time actually did not really agree with Oshima's report and noted that the chance for a war between Germany and the Soviet Union was just 40% and then he assumed that the re-establishing of harmonious affairs was at 60%. Meanwhile, war minister Hideoko Tosho commented, I do not think it is an urgent matter. Kotani summarizes the whole issue of the Japanese not adapting properly to the new and crucial information as follows. In Japanese war making, we see that once a prescribed plan was officially decided by political leaders, it was almost impossible to change course by rational ideas and intelligence, even if the strategy had been decided on the basis of unsupported and subjective data. In other words, building a consensus among Ministries took priority over understanding international relations and world affairs. It is important to add here that similar sluggishness is also attributed to the Japanese military during the war. This is an old trope that is not supported by current research. Once Operation Barbarossa had started, the Japanese adopted a wait and see attitude. As mentioned previously, to conduct a successful attack, the Japanese would have to move a lot of troops and equipment. This would require a lot of shipping from Japan to Manchuria. It would not only tie up railroad capacity within Japan, but also monopolize the entire resources of the South Manchurian Railway, Japan's quasi-official rail line in Manchuria, for two months. Hence, the Japanese general staff opted to only intervene once the Soviet Union was close to collapse, falling into Japanese hands like a ripe persimmon, as the staff put it. Yet there was also the Kanto Kuen plan, or the Kwangtang Army's special maneuvers. It was an operational plan to capture the farthest regions of the Soviet Union. It was approved by the Japanese Emperor in July 1941. However, this would still require a substantial build-up of forces and supplies. But in the meantime, the Japanese also occupied French Indochina in July. This resulted in President Roosevelt freezing Japanese assets in the United States. Although some wanted to continue the build-up, the policy was changed. By early August 1941, however, national policy was shifting, partly in response to the economic freeze being applied to Japan by Western powers, partly because of the allure of Southeast Asia, and partly because the army was less confident about the possibility of a German victory over the USSR occurring during 1941. As such, on 9th August 1941, 
The generals that have decided against attacking the Soviet Union, at least for now. To summarize, the Japanese did not join Operation Barbarossa, since the battles of Kalkingol were a serious defeat for the Imperial Japanese Army. The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact that was signed at the time was also seen as a German betrayal by the Japanese. Both of these incidents led to a policy that aimed at the Pacific. Another factor was that Southeast Asia had more important resources than the Soviet Far East. Additionally, Hitler did not inform the Japanese, since he assumed he would defeat the Soviet Union swiftly. Furthermore, he wanted the Japanese to keep the British busy and deter the USA from entering the war. Well, I hope you liked this episode. Thanks to Justin for helping with sources and reviewing the script. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. As always, sources are listed in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.